Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. We actually have a record number of attendees today. We are predicting approximately 35 to 45 minutes together, tackling two distinct topics. SP ratio as one topic, which is becoming more and more relevant. There's a lot of information out there these days, particularly when it comes to outdoor lighting and night. And the other subject is delivered lumens versus total lumens, which I suspect has brought the majority of you here today. So without further ado, let's begin topic one. SP ratio. Basically, photopic versus scotopic. They are two absolute phenomenons that will affect our vision and our perception of what we see, but only photopic is typically considered when we are putting our literature together as manufacturers, and when we consider total lumens, we're only looking at the photopic side. This is the typical equipment that we're using in laboratories around the world for measuring light bulbs. This is a light sphere on one side and a handheld lumen or lux meter on the other side. This is the equipment that us in the lighting industry are using to publish our rated lumens. And this is for bulbs. This is the type of product used for individual bulbs. Let's talk about the differences between photopic and scotopic. Remembering that we are not doctors here at Max Light University, but photopic is known as light or daylight vision. It affects the cones in our eyes, has a higher sensitivity to brighter light, peak sensitivity towards the reddish colors, and it is, as I mentioned, the basis for modern photometry, the way that we measure and publish light. Scotopic, on the other hand, is known as the dark or night vision. It affects the rods in the eyes rods and cones, higher sensitivity and speed in different spectral range, peak sensitivity towards the blue as opposed to the red in the photopic. It is affected most by high color temperature lamps. As mentioned, the rods are active in bright light and do contribute to the perception of brightness. It's not just the warmer colors and the cones, but we have to consider the all of the human eye and how we perceive light. Scotopic contributes to improved acuity, but this isn't well defined, and we're going to talk in a minute about why it's so difficult to define. But the basic point is higher scotopic sources can provide equivalent brightness with lower energy. Let's let's discuss this a little deeper. Basically, you're always going to have a problem when you're mixing physics and biology. The physics side is very predictable. We know exactly what's going to happen. It's very well behaved. Where the biological side is, it's not so predictable. It's not consistent. And the human eye ages a factor and other thing. But let's let's take a look. The best that Blake can put together for you of some photopic versus scotopic, the same conditions. In the top left, we have a picture that's used often for demonstrating white light versus yellow light or high CRI versus low CRI. On the top right, we have a parking lot in what looks like high pressure sodium next to what looks like LED. On the bottom left, my favorite here, because it's a true before and after retrofit, and I think it, it clearly demonstrates the differences, where on the right, you could barely make out the detail, and on the left, after a LED upgrade and higher CRI, cooler Kelvin temperatures, it's the picture really comes alive, and that visual experience is very well pronounced when you're there on site. This picture here, I've used it before. I took this picture myself. What you have here is a parking garage that was very well lit with HID lamps on the inside. And as you can see, you have natural sunlight, 100 CRI, about noonish or so. So it was about six or 6,500 Kelvin. And what you'll notice is that under both colors, both CRI, you can see some color changes. You can see blotches, light and dark. But only with the higher CRI, the higher Kelvin temperature, the natural sunlight, can you actually see the texture even further down the wall. I hope it comes through as well through the internet as it's demonstrated here. And if not, by the way, we will send a copy of this whole presentation, both part one and part two, to all of you after our presentation today. Now let's take a look at the numbers. Scotopic photopic ratio is a consideration of Kelvin temperature along with CRI not just total lumen output. Poor CRI light sources such as high and low pressure sodium have a distorting effect on the subject even though it's higher total lumens when we use those photometric meters. It is actually not better visually. A little demonstration of that on the right side, that's Blake's girlfriend there. And what we see on the top is a warm color of 3000 K with a low CRI of 52. In the middle, that same warmer color and a much higher, what's considered high CRI, of 82. 
And then finally on the bottom, we see her in 6500 Kelvin, which is very close to natural sunlight, with a high 82 CRI, and you can visually see the difference from one to the other. This is known as scotopic-photopic ratio, this phenomenon. Basically what it says is it's impacted by high CRIs of 80 or better, and the cooler the color temperature, the closer to natural sunlight, the higher the perception. Many in the industry are using SP ratio numbers. These are pretty conservative numbers. Uh, there are higher ones out there, but someday when the governing authorities, the DOE, the IES, they settle on numbers, we'll use those numbers if they differ from what we're sharing with you today. And you should know also that in Japan, as a matter of fact, they are using 6,500 to 10,000 Kelvin color light bulbs indoors for lighting their indoors both commercially and residentially with a high CRI. So they have a scotopic photopic ratio of 2.14. But here in the States, we, we prefer it a little warmer than that. 5,000 K is generally accepted as a very cool or natural sunlight. That combined with a high CRI of 80 CRI plus you can pretty much assume a 1.96 or about double the perception of light than what the actual photometric data reveals in a light sphere and that type of equipment. So let, let's break that down in, in that phenomenon that we've all experienced where the lower wattage replacement looked so much brighter than the higher wattage low scotopic ratio products. This is how it happens. So we take on the top side, we have a 250 watt high pressure sodium. On the bottom side, we have a 140 watt aerolite type fixture. That high pressure sodium is approximately 25,000 lumens, but because it has a very low CRI and the Kelvin temperature doesn't activate the rods in our eyes and therefore is not maximum perception, is negative at a 0.62. So it gives us a scotopic lumen of about 15,000. Whereas where we're using more than 100 watts less with this high scotopic product, that is 5,000 K and high CRI, that's about 8,400 lumens initially. We have a scotopic photopic ratio of a 1.96 that gives us about 16,000 plus lumen. So you can see visually, it looks a little brighter than the other. Now, what we are not doing here is factoring in means lumens. We are not factoring in the extreme lumen depreciation that you mostly find with HID lamps, where you have maybe 30% lumen depreciation in the first five to 8,000 hours. That's not factored in here. So it's, this is not as far visually as it will actually look after the installation is done. I want to point out here also that we have a raw bulb with the 250 watt high pressure sodium, and we have a complete fixture with the LED 5000 Kelvin product. And that is a segue to our part two. All right, is everybody fresh? Let's move on. What we're going to discuss here in part two is delivered lumens versus total lumens. We have all experienced the phenomenon. Uh, we've all had to address the question. As an example, I get questioned often something like, well, I have a three lamp, two by four troffer. I have three T8s at about 3,000 lumens each. That's 9,000 lumens. How come Max Light University is telling us that a 4,500 lumen LED troffer is going to give me more light on the work surface. How can that be? And we're attempting here to share with you exactly how that is done. Now on the bottom we have a fluorescent three lamp troffer simulation and next to that we have an HID high bay type fixture. Thank you Blake by the way for putting these drawings together for us. All right, omnidirectional light sources require almost 80% of the output to be redirected. In other words, it doesn't go directly from the light source to the work surface, but it has to reflect off of surfaces. The majority of the reflections are directed back into the bulb, overwhelming majority. Every time a light source is reflected, it has energy loss, and that energy loss is compounded. So it just gets weaker and weaker every time it reflects. With total lumens, with traditional light sources, most light traces require multiple reflections before hitting the work surface. Only 14% or less of the lumens trace directly to the work surface. So what we have here in yellow is showing that a small percentage of only about 14% go directly from your light bulb to your work surface. 
The green represents where there is one reflection from the light source to the work surface, and the red represents multiple reflections and light that never reaches the work surface. On the HID side, similarly, with this type of configuration, we generally have less than 14% of the light being efficiently used. When we're measuring total lumens, it does not speak to the light that reaches the work surface. Let's talk about delivered lumens. With delivered lumens, more than 94% of the directional lumens are delivered, make it actually to the work surface. 80% of the total lumen output is directly on the work surface, where 20% or less is reflected, as opposed to 78% or more that's reflected with the total delivered lumens. The remaining 20% reflected only once. So with HID, R lamps, PAR lamps, and other monodirectional light sources, we have 100% or 94% of the lumens are delivered. There's always a little bit of losses within the optics of the individual LEDs. That's why we're not saying 100%, but that 94 is getting higher. So let's be conservative and say 94% plus of the lumens are delivered directly to the work surface, uh, with only a small percentage of them being reflected only once, as opposed to HID and fluorescent, where they're reflected multiple times. None of the lumens are reflected back into the bulb. This is significant. With total lumens, up to 20% of the light is reflected back to the bulb. That light is weakened if it ever makes it to the work surface and often never makes it to the work surface. Where with delivered lumens, direct light sources, we have the majority of the light reaching the work surface on its first plane, a little bit of it reflecting once, never more than once, and in R lamp high bay applications where you're pushing all the light in one direction, you're not looking for volumetric light, but you're looking for more spots or aisle lighting, you have 94 plus percent of the light going directly to the work surface without being reflected at all. Remembering that each reflection weakens the energy. And here's a summary, total lumens versus delivered lumens. You can see that it's much less efficient in the total lumen scenario. Now there's more. We're going to help you to understand the proper way of measuring light is not by total lumens or delivered lumen. In fact, it's by doing a professional light layout. Instead of lumen output, the best and most relevant measurement for evaluating LED light fixtures and for making accurate comparisons with conventional fixtures with the incumbent technology, we have to use delivered light the formal term for this measurement of delivered light is luminescence, and roughly speaking, a luminescence is the intensity of light that falls on a surface area, what we've been referring to as the work surface. If the area is measured in square foot, then the unit of luminescence is foot candles. If the measure is square meters, the unit of luminescence is lux. That's another question that we're asked often, what's the difference between uh, foot candles and lux? and it's basically Europe and the US and the rest of the world goes pretty much both ways. Here in the States we're using foot candles to demonstrate our delivered lumens. Delivered lumens describe how much useful light the light fixture can deliver to the task area or the work area, discounting any wasted light. Fixtures total lumen output does not account for wasted light because LED lighting fixtures are fundamentally directional LED fixtures typically waste much less light than the conventional counterparts, the fluorescent and the HID mainly, and LED delivers more total light output to the task or work area. An LED light fixture with lower rated lumens may in fact give you more light than the traditional incumbent technologies with lower power. Let's talk a little bit about traditional fixtures just to show you how different they are in performance and in measurement compared to LED. Conventional light fixtures are tested using relative photometry. In relative photometry, luminaires and lamps are tested separately. They're two completely different engineering disciplines. They're separate specialties, each with its own standards and practices. The total luminous flux and chromaticity, which is color, of a fixture's lamps are typically measured with an integrating sphere, and we, we talked about that and we showed an integrating sphere earlier. But when you're measuring an entire luminaire, that's typically measured with a Ghana photometer. I've seen one of these things. They're huge, they're pretty amazing, and LED technology is going to obsolete them.
LED fixtures are typically inseparable from the luminaire. This is what people have to understand. This is definitely the direction of the future. Right now we have replacement parts because we are designing LED retrofits to go into your existing housings. But over time, you will buy completely new LED fixtures, probably the last one for that application in a lifetime. LEDs, whether it be a retrofit kit or a whole new fixture or a bulb are inseparable from their other components. Because they're inseparable from the luminaire, let's say, the light source, relative photometry is inappropriate for measuring the light output of LED fixtures. Instead, LED fixtures are tested using photometry. The approved procedures for testing conditions for absolute photometry are spelled out in the electrical and photometric measurement of solid state lighting products. This is known as, we all have heard it, LM79 which was published in 2008. This is the proper way of measuring an LED luminaire, which is not separate from how we measure the LEDs. It doesn't become a light source until they are all together. In absolute photometry, only fixture lumens are measured and not lamp lumens because a separate measurement of LEDs independent of the fixture is, well, it's not possible and it's not meaningful. It doesn't say anything about the actual foot candles, the light you're going to get, unless they are together. Fixture efficiency, which compares lamp lumens to fixture lumens, therefore has no meaning for an LED lighting fixture. We in the lighting industry need to compare the total lamp lumens of a conventional lighting fixture with the total fixture lumens of an LED fixture. If we can do that, we are then comparing apples to apples, as opposed to saying 9,000 lumens in a fluorescent versus 45 or 5,000 lumens in an LED. We need to look at not the sum of the bulbs in that fluorescent fixture, but the actual fixture output. To make a valid comparison, you must reduce the measured lamp lumens of the conventional fixture by its efficiency. This reduction is typically reported in a zonal lumen summary chart. We've all seen these charts. If you're not familiar with them, they're not that complicated. For the example we're going to use today, something we can all relate to regardless of where we are in the lighting marketing food chain, we're going to use an under cabinet as an example. A T2, fluorescent T2 under cabinet fluorescent fixture prominently reports that it's 860 lumens because we have two 430 lamps. However, the zonal lumen summary chart reports it's only 575 total fixture lumens. This is because the fixture output is only 66.9% of the total lamp lumens. So we have 66.9 times 860 is 575. This means that 33.1% of the light produced by these lamps is wasted, is not making it to the work surface. It's just literally wasted energy. LED-based under cabinet fixture designed for a similar lighting application will show the total delivered lumens. Using the zonal summary report going to 100% of the fixture output, you can learn what the total fixture output is for the traditional light sources. This is how we have to compare apples to apples when we want to compare conventional light sources to LED light sources. The best way, however, and I'll remind you, is to have a full lighting layout done, not only just with the proposed LED fixture, but to have a layout done side by side using the existing technology. And then you can see spot for spot, zone for zone, what the foot candles were or are currently compared to what they will be after the retrofit. And looking at total lumens is not the answer. Now folks, we hope you found this webinar to be helpful and informational. We know we went through two pretty difficult subjects rather quickly, so that is why we will send you this full webinar. And in a couple of weeks or so, you will find it also posted at maxlight.com under webinars and at YouTube so that you can watch it, refer it to your friends, and the like. Also know that the University of Maxlight has put out two Android apps. We're working on iProduct apps, but right now we have two Android apps. One that brings you directly to the university, the other that brings you directly to the Maxlight website. So do go to the Google Play Store and download those free apps. Also remember that university.maxlight.com is open 24 7 We have several hundred students registered already. And we also have, Blake, what, about a dozen people who've made it through the full sessions? Yes, that's correct. And so uh, feel free to register and join as well. Any questions asked during today's webinar will be answered via email. Thank you all again for joining. We hope that this time has been well spent.